Welcome to week 15. <sighs> we are getting there. We are almost done. And um, I don't know if I would like to say this is saving the best for last, but I love the article we are going to be covering this week called Why Mo? The Case Against Lawns, written by Michael Pollan. Okay, I am aware of the fact that it was written in 1989. So, <clears throat> that being the case, um, <laughs> it is aged, but surprisingly, it's aged well in the fact that this is something to consider as we move forward and recognizing that lawns are not sustainable and they're not really that healthy for us or the environment around us. And I'll be honest with you, I like green lawns. I really do. And it's always hard for me to cover this because I'm like, oh, it goes against what I like. But it's also recognition of what are some more alternatives to that? Uh, with this reading, I included a supplement, which is um, the New York Times. Uh, I did a Google Doc of it, but it's a Google Times article <sighs> about uh, Lake Mead is drying up. Las Vegas is now pulling up lawns. If you got a lawn, it's getting gone. So uh, Lake Mead, if you know, is what pretty much waters Vegas. So anyway, uh, long story short, lawns really aren't good for us. <laughs> Uh, but maybe there's more to that, and let's take a look at it. Um, as a heads up, we will have a quiz at the end. I might not cover everything in this lecture, just as a heads up, so please make sure you do the reading, because you might be looking at the quiz going, she didn't say this. That's because not always do I end up catching everything, so please take a look at the reading if you have not already. All right, so when we think about lawns, we think of lawns as this great American thing, right? We love our white picket fences, our lawns, all that, that, you know, nostalgic sort of thing, whatever the, the social statement is about what lawns are. Um, to each throw, not everyone likes that, but some people do. We have what we might call a civic responsibility to mowing our lawns, right? That idea of I want you to uphold your property value so that my property value stays up too. Okay, so now we have this kind of responsibility because of lawns, okay? Um, nowhere else in the world are lawns as prized as they are in America. Um, again, this was written in 1989. I think it still holds uh, when we think about that statistic, but you are free to argue me that, uh, argue me on that if you would like. Um, so the first paragraph talks about lawn scaling in the United States. And if, and maybe it's only, I have not been over the entire world. I have only been in some places. Um, but for the most part, states outside of California, I usually see a lot more lack of fences and more sprawling lawns and where one lawn bleeds into the other. So um, the idea in America is to take away all the fences, right? We don't want fences because we want to all be together on this land. Um, one thing to keep in mind is the problem is when we think about, you know, the statement in uh, Poland's article where it says the suburban vista can be marred by the negligence of the descent of a single property owner. All right. And that pretty much means your property value goes down when your neighbors don't mow their lawn. <laughs> and so they, again, that civic responsibility between each other and this is why a lot of times there are HOAs, the Housing Ownership Association. I don't know what the O is, HOA. Anyway, the idea is you're paying money to make sure that everyone does the same thing and so that it is uniform. And each HOA has its own rules and its own guidelines on what you can paint a house and what you can put out front and all that stuff. So um, I personally could see how maybe people like that, but financially, I'm like, that's an extra rent right there. <laughs> HOAs are pretty expensive sometimes, and you don't really get a lot of freedom in there. So, and maybe that's what you want. Maybe you like the idea of everyone kind of having a similar, or you might say cookie cutter type of look. Um, and maybe aesthetically that brings you pleasure. And that's totally okay. That's like, you know, to each their own. Anyway, this is what we talk about when we talk about property values and owning land and controlling land and land dominance. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, I recall growing up in paradise, uh, my dad, and we are not the kind of people, like my dad would pick on the neighbors across the way because um, it's not that they were in a mobile home, but it was that they had a mannequin on the deck of the mobile home and the the lady who I love, her name's Becky, she used to decorate the mannequin in different ways and put her in different poses. And 
as a kid, I thought that was hilarious. Is my dad? He's like, oh, that's trashy. Says my father, who had <laughs> old uh, cars, because my dad uh, would restore cars. So we would have cars sitting on, you know, not the lawn, but in the driveway to some extent. And then the neighbors are mad at my dad, going, oh, that's white trash, you know? So, and again, forgive my terms on this. This was, you know, again, 90s terms. When we were growing up, these were things that were said. So forgive me on that. Um, anywho, do you notice that the one is judging the other, judging the other, right? So to each their own on what they feel is appropriate for lawns. Um, for me, uh, there are times where I will go walk around Cal Park. Why? Because I live in an apartment <laughs> and I like the idea of being in a neighborhood and it brings me like some sort of nostalgia of growing up in Sacramento with my mom and, you know, everyone had these nice green lawns and they've kept it clean and whatever and I have an alleyway you know so for me to see a lawn brings me a certain sort of comfort and again I recognize that I understand uh, as we get further along in this conversation what it really means um, but for me I actually really enjoyed a lawn so again this is not a you know lawns are terrible for everything you know don't do that that's to each their own I'm just giving you a recognition of what lawns do okay so there's a lot of power in having a green lawn and a nice yard. Um, in the story, uh, or in, sorry, in the article, um, Poland talks a lot about his father and his father's dissent against the lawn. And after a while, the father stopped mowing the lawn. Okay, so it was getting so big. I mean, it's starting to flower and starting to reseed. Well, now it's starting to reseed the neighbor's yard. So you can imagine the neighbors are getting pretty annoyed. I don't know if you've ever had a situation where you were a kid and you went to pick up the dandelion and blow it and someone yelled at you, you're going to put weeds in my lawn. I didn't know that until one time someone yelled at me and I'm blowing it all excited and making my wishes come true. Um, and I, <laughs> I got yelled at for that because I was literally spreading the seeds to create more weeds. Anyway, um, so the neighbors are getting kind of, ups kind of upset. They're getting pretty upset but they're being kind of passive aggressive and kind about it. Like, hey, do you need to borrow my lawnmower? Is yours on the fritz? Those types of lines where it's like trying not to say it, but say it at the same time. Because again, the father's lack of taking care of his lawn is now upsetting the rest of the neighborhood. Um, it's, it's one of those things. So I remember one time, and this relates to the article where I did not, I was living in Hawaii at the time. I was a military wife and I was working full time, going to school full time, all by myself. And I don't think I'd ever mowed a lawn in my life. And you could tell. And our lawn was about three inches or three feet high. And someone came through and mowed the lawn for me. And I could think they might have done it out of the kindness of their heart. But being it was on a military base, I'm pretty sure they did it because they needed to, <laughs> because it was getting a little disorderly. Um, and that's very similar to the reading where they're talking about um, the Great Gatsby, um, where, uh, what's his name, mows Nick's lawn, right? Because it's just so chaotic. It's like, I cannot handle this. I must mow your lawn. Um, so those are just things to think about how lawns have been such a huge part of the American story and it being looking a certain way. And so obviously in the article, the dad's like, F this noise, like, I'm not doing that. Um, to the point where finally he goes to mow it and what does he mow? His initials. <laughs> anyway, so um, this is just something to think about. Like it was kind of his way of sticking it to the man. Like, I don't have to do anything. This is my land. You don't owe, you know, it's my land was pretty much his statement on that. Um, let's go through. Um, that's right. It was Gatsby who cut uh, Nick's lawn. I have a whole list of notes that I'm going through. So that's what I do. I don't know. I mean, we were so late in the season, you know, here. If you take notes like me, I probably won't post as many on uh, Canvas as I usually do. Um, but I like to make notes while I'm reading so I can kind of go back to it or I highlight. Depends on how you do it. Anyway. All right, so uh, let's go to much. Okay, we're going to go and quote Poland here. Much as we have come to distrust it, the urge to dominate nature is a deeply human one. We've talked about that. It is for some reason ingrained in our bones to dominate nature in some way, shape, or form. Um, and then for 
many people, oftentimes mowing a lawn is our answer to that domination. All right. So mowing lawns gives us a sense of ownership and power and dominance and, you know, just some things that satisfy maybe natural urges that are deeply ingrained in us as human beings to take care of the things around us or to dominate the things around us. Or maybe aesthetically, we just like the way it looks, or maybe the HOA demands that we do that. Okay. So uh, author talks about how after his father's unwillingness to take care of his lawn, the author kind of put it in his own mind, like, I will always have a nice lawn. I won't be like my father. I'm going to do what I want and make my lawn as beautiful as I can do it. Hours of work, hours of work. In fact, the author says, my lawn, my lawn was a part of, uh, my lawn was a part of nature made fit for human habitation, right? So making his lawn beautiful to say, look, someone lives here. Okay, it's not gathering the newspapers, it's not seeding your lawn because it's overgrowing. Um, somebody lives here and they care. Okay, so that's his first line when he first starts working on his lawn. Um, you know, and then the idea that perhaps the allure of lawns is in the genes, right? Is it in our genes? It might be. I know deep down I don't have an excuse why we didn't really have a lawn when I grew up in paradise, but I, I yearn for it, whatever that means, and I don't understand it myself. Um, he uses a long called the Savannah syndrome, um, where the thought is that encoded in our DNA is the preference for an open grassy landscape resembling the short grass savannas of Africa in which we evolved and spent our first million years. Okay, so that's Poland's idea of maybe this is why we do it. We don't really know. Okay, so uh, I have a link in Canvas for this Frederick Law Oldstem. Uh, Olmsted, sorry, uh, from 1868 was actually received to commission to design a place called Riverdale uh, in Illinois, and he planned the first suburban community in America, and that was in 1868. Um, the idea that there's this community built with or with the dominance of nature, right? Rather than being within nature, it creates a more, like the suburban, the whole, the very first suburban community, right? Like what did that look like? And I have a link to show you uh, of a book too, where you can look through all the different ways in which um, uh, Frank J. Scott, so like in 1870, Frank J. Scott created the book, um, The Art of Beautif Beautifying the Suburban Home Grounds. So Olmsted created the sur suburban neighborhood and then Frank J. Uh, J. Scott created the book on how to take care of it, right? So now we're developing this way of how it should be, okay? Um, the idea of this term white trash, by the way, was coined in 19th century where chickens, broken farm equipment, mud, weeds, patch, patches of veggies, like that was considered um, the term white trash. So I don't know how I feel about that term but it's the one that we're using within this article. And I might have different opinions on this in a little bit. But anyway, um, the idea is we want to reach and go beyond that and create something that's more settled, more aesthetically pleasing. Okay. Um, what else are we talking about here? So the lawn uh, provided stability and a grand stage for proud display of one's own house. So in America, we cut down the, the uh, fences, right? We don't have the fences. We have these open uh, yards. And the idea was to stick it to the, to the English who are always having those brick walls with broken bottles on the top, really just hiding their home from the lower class citizens. But in America, we are all, you know, the idea is we're all middle class on the same page. So we all have the same lawn. We don't need fences. Um, you can see that has changed quite a bit um, in the original idea versus where we're at now. Um, you know, theory and application are always different. Yards were organized to capture the admiration of the street. The idea is, look at me, look at my house, look at my house, it's so beautiful. Okay, and that's why there, you don't often see fences in front of yards. Um, in California, I see it a lot more than I do in other places. I know I've mentioned that before, but I think back when... Like I was living in Hawaii and it was kind of the same. I didn't see as many fences and it was almost weird to me because, you know, we go to a ba our backyard or our friend's backyard and, you know, across the way there was no fences. So their yard and our yard and their yard, they were all like the same. Like, how do you know where to stop mowing? <laughs> right? So it's just like this concept of fences is not something that all 
states and people and whatever, you know, abide by or want or need. So anyway, that just something that always pops up in my head when I read this. All right. So, um, at some point the author goes F this noise, like this is too much. Like the amount of time and energy and hours and weekends spent trying to keep the long grain, get rid of, you know, getting rid of the weeds. My mom is retired and she lives up in Red Bluff now. She was born out of paradise, but she lives in Red Bluff now. And like, she's practically pulling out her hair, trying to handle weeds. Like she's retired and all she does is work on the lawn. She comes home, she's all sweating. Oh, those weeds. I'm like, mom, just mow over the weeds. <laughs> if you mow over them, it's just as green as the grass. Like nobody really cares. Right. So anyway, I think it's one of those, she's kind of feeling the same way the author is where it's like, there's just so much work. Is it worth it? Like the reality is he doesn't think so. Um, to the point where he starts to get rid of the lawn and create a garden, right? Have the land work for you versus you working against the land. Okay. And the idea here is helping, you know, at the same thing, like in uh, California, forgive me for changing my, my thought pattern here in California, I'm noticing an uptick in planting plants that are native versus non-native, um, water, um, you know, sustainable for drought, drought tolerant. Thank you. Um, and so there's a lot going on where we're starting to recognize where, maybe we've dominated the land a little too much and we kind of can't afford it financially or economically or uh, environmentally, right? We don't have any more water. We're running out. All right. So West Coast is definitely running out of water to the point where it's like, is it worth having a green lawn if, you know, we don't have water to sustain it or ourselves? Um, so it's something to be mindful of. And again, I'm not saying boo lawns because I too love the way they look, but at the same time, is it worth it? Is it sustainable? Is it something that like, what's our ultimate point of having the lawn just to look good? So then our ego is more involved. I don't know. This is a question to ask yourself. Um, so anyway, we're just really looking uh, deep and hard at understanding like why, why do we feel we need to have these lawns? There's AstroTurf, there's all kinds of stuff. I'm sure AstroTurf is just bad for the environment. We've got plastic on the ground, but anywho, you know what I mean? Like that's the question. Like at what point are we trying so hard to sustain this idea or this image or this thing to where we're damaging everything, you know, ourselves, the people around us, the environment, the plants, the bugs, the bees, for God's sake. Oh, poor bees. I'm not going to get into bees this semester. You can look it up. It's not good. Please don't use Roundup. <laughs> okay. So the question here is we've developed a deep distrust of individualistic approaches to landscape. So again, this was in 1989, but I think it still upholds to this day where when we see someone else doing something different with their land, it offends us. It hurts our feelings. I don't understand why I get it. I understand it. It's like my father and the neighbor who had the mannequin or our neighbor who hated my father who had trucks in the middle of the you know road. It wasn't that bad, but it was still there. <laughs> and so the question is, why do we have such this urge to control other people versus our own area, right? Is it the property value? Is that our fear that money's involved? Is it that it's just not what we would do and we would do something different? So please do what we want you to do. I mean, I guess that's why you get into an HOA, right? So that someone there is making sure that it looks exactly the way you were told it should look. Um, I don't know. That's totally a question for each person who makes that choice in where they live and what they do with their land. Um, but there is something about that. Seeing someone do something different with their land where you're like, mm, I don't like it. I don't like you now, right? <laughs> I don't know. To each their own. Um, the land is simply too important to our identity as Americans to simply allow everyone to have their way with it, right? So I find the irony in that statement of, uh, you see that in political views, you don't think the way I think. So, you know, and there's this, this thing that for some reason, someone else making a choice against what we choose hurts our identity. This goes on both sides. This is not a you or him or there. This goes on both sides. Like, you didn't choose what I would have choosed. And that offends my, you know, my identity versus understanding where they're choosing their choice. So anyway, the other question on that working with both lands and I guess politics is when we aren't doing, or like, I guess you would say 
when we're not taking care of our land and it starts affecting other people, I guess then there is a point where you have to say, all right, hold up. Okay, your land is actually infringing on my land, so now let's do something about it. Can you be more respectful? I don't know. So, do you see how it just gets all grayed up? No black and white here. That's just, that's the way the world works. <laughs> all right, so instead of an arena for self-expression, like each land being the arena for self-expression, the American Lawn Collective nationally, uh, national, ritualized, and plain begins to look inevitable right? So the idea here is that the, the author is pretty much growing weary of the land mowing, pro the lawn mowing process. The idea of like, it's too exhausting. It's too exhausting upkeeping this land. And so he goes for the garden. Okay. Um, I know it's a long article and I have some notes that jump into other notes. So I apologize if I'm skipping around a little bit. So our question is lawns versus gardens. What do we choose and why do we choose it? And should we? I mean, I don't want to say anyone should. I think we should, I mean, guys, we should consider um, what's going to be best for ourselves, our land, um, the world around us. <laughs> All right. So a lawn was nature under culture's boot. So a lawn is under uh, our control, right? Culture's boot, meaning as a society, we're creating land or we're creating lawns so that we can dominate, right? The question is, are we battling it? Or are we working it? And with lawns, in my experience, with my mother's experience, with the author's experience, hell, I grew up in paradise. We've tried it. Green lawns do not work. <laughs> um, are we battling it? Yeah, of course. So if we're battling it, is that worth it? Or should we just be working with it? And if we're working with it, what could come of that? And it kind of sounds like you could create more fruits of your labor, as it were. You can have gardens of fruit. You can have gardens of vegetables. You can actually have the land working with you while you work with it, right? It can help you. Um, that's what my parents ended up doing up in Red Bluff. They just started planting stuff to make food. I cannot tell you how many zucchinis my mother has brought me. I can't, I can't keep up with the zucchinis, mom. Um, but then she's learning how to work with it too. And I think that's really neat. And, you know, you can actually create a really cool sense of community with a garden. Um, you know, you have all these extra vegetables and then you go to your neighbor, you're like, would you like some extra vegetables? I have all these, please take them before they rot. <laughs> and so that's another way where you're like, wow, maybe instead of having that such a green lawn, maybe I can utilize it for something else. And, um, I have some friends up in Ojai, uh, Ojai, California, and, uh, they turn their front lawn into a garden. And I think there was a little bit of pushback at first, and then they started to recognize the importance of it. And then it just became like one that it was okay. And others started following suit. And again, this community of sharing and, um, I don't know, it makes my heart warm when I think of that. And it, it pulls away my, I must have a green lawn feel and think, Ooh, I could grow something. Have you ever tried to grow something by the way? Like watch the little green bud get real big. You're like, Oh, this is so exciting. <laughs> In my heart, that's what I've, I've seen. I'm like, Ooh, that's so cool. I grew something and then you can eat it. So like asking ourselves where deep in our hearts do we really want to be when it comes to lawns? So any cool, anyway, um, so gardening creates an intimacy of the land versus a dominance, right? You're working with the land, you're creating something, you're working with it like, hey, what do you need lawn? And it kind of talks to you because it dies or it grows a thousand zucchinis, right? So um, it's a really cool concept working with the land versus working against it. Um, and again, lawns are natural. Lawns are not natural. They're so not natural that the natural thing, which is weeds, always wants to take over. <laughs> and like I told my mom, just mow for the, lead, the weeds, mom. It's just the same color as the grass. No one's going to know. And nobody notices except my mom. And even then she's like, dude, I'm too tired. I'm just going to mow, mow over the weeds. Well, there you go. By the way, make sure they don't get too big because I think the higher weeds go, the deeper they go. <laughs> My brother and I, we had to uh, weed his backyard, but the weeds were like over our heads and we were trying to pull out the stalks. Oh my God. Anyway, I'm going on a tangent. I apologize. Y'all, it's week 15. Let's just get through it. Okay. So what is our solution here? Or at least what is Poland's suggestion? Kind of sounds like gardens are the thing, right? Like, why can't we work with it versus against it? Like, do we have to have that social norm of having green lawns? Again, I'm not saying no to lawns because I flip and love them too. But at the same time, I have to ask myself, how is that helping anybody? I don't know. 
um, you know, maybe aesthetically, maybe because of the HOAs. Um, I don't know. And again, I would get to choose if ever I had a house. I don't know. Housing market's kind of funky. Anyway, <laughs> you know, if ever I have a house, what do I choose? Do I want that beautiful green lawn or do I want to work with the land? Do I have time for that? Hell no. <laughs> would I love that? Sure. Absolutely. So anyway, um, in the end, um, my question to the author is this bro has got way too much time and money on his hands. I just, I, say, I will, I will tell you that <laughs> I do not have time to have a lawn. Um, that's why our landlord hires someone to do the lawn for us because it's a lot of work. I even see her in the afternoons out in the lawn, making it look pretty. Um, I mean, that's, that's her land. Um, it's her property and I respect that a lot. I love that she takes care of, uh, the yard. I don't have the time for it. So I do appreciate that. Um, and then if we had a garden then who's going to take care of that. So land in itself is a big responsibility. And, you know, that's why, you know, a lot of times not everyone can take care of their lawn. And sometimes they just let it go because they're tired or they're sick or there's a lot going on. So consider that when you're driving by and you see the newspapers piling up or the grass getting really high. Um, and if it's a close, you know, a neighbor who's close enough, you can maybe check on them, make sure they're still alive, you know, make sure if they are sick that you maybe might help them out. Um, and so that's just kind of like the one cool thing about lawns is it just tells us maybe the state of mind or where somebody is at in that time. And it gives you an opportunity to go, are you doing okay? Should I check on you? Do you need some soup? So anyway, um, again, this is all first world problems, right? Where it's like, my grass is too green. I have to mow it. <laughs> so I get that. I understand that. Um, but in America, we actually get that, you know, opportunity to make these decisions on what we get to do with our lawn and, you know, what a blessing and a curse at the same time. So anywho, uh, I don't think I answered all the questions in the quiz, but to be honest with you, as much as I love you all and I love lecturing, I'm, I could do so much more, but I'm going to cut it short, um, and say, go ahead and enjoy the quiz after and make sure you get that source summary number two done. Um, that is due on Sunday. So if you have any questions, please make sure to reach out to me. Um, also don't forget to watch all of the videos and read all the things and it'll pretty much answer your questions, but I am still here for you. So good luck, have fun. And I hope 30 minutes was enough for you. So I will see you on the other side.